Welcome back to the Dr. Connect show, a home for open conversations and education around cancer, health, and wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Ludmila Schaefer, and today's show packed with a lot of interesting news and updates and year in review on cancer. Visit us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Dr. Connect, and submit your questions on cancers on thedoctorconnect.org where you also find the information on my upcoming book, Success Strategy. Stay with us till the end of the show, because we will answer your questions in cancers. Most importantly, today, I'm so thrilled and excited because I'm joined by a very, very special guest, Dr. Jennifer Weider. If you don't know Dr. Weider, she is a nationally renowned women's health expert, author of four books and radio host. Dr. Wider has appeared on the Today Show, CBC, ABS, CNN, Fox News, Good Day New York, and many, many other platforms. She sits on the advisory board for Cosmopolitan Magazine and Health Magazine. Dr. Wider has been an invited guest lecturer at a variety of hospitals, women's centers all across the nation. She frequently published on newspapers, magazines all across the country. Why am I telling this? Because she is an expert to help you to understand how important to take care of your health, especially during busy holiday times and provide health tools to start using in upcoming 2022. A year 2021 brought a lot of advances in cancer. And for the past 50 years, the cumulative effect of advances in cancer it overall it made decrease overall cancer incidence and death rate in the United States. That's why your checkups and cancer screening can help find potential health issues before they become a problem. Now, let's welcome Dr. Jennifer Weider. Dr. Weider, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you Thank so much you. for joining. I am so excited to have you. We are so thrilled. Excited to be here. Thank you. Now, we are discussing in 2021. It has been another difficult year, but it's a lot of exciting news in cancer overall, in oncology, in health, in wellness. And uh, from uh, my perspective as an oncologist, we've seen that the medical knowledge just increasing so fast. In the past, we used to have medical knowledge at the rate maybe every five to 10 years. And now it's pretty much not only every several months, several weeks, and sometimes also several days. And the uh, amount of new information is just obscene. So I would like to start and for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and um, introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. So, yeah, so I am a women's health doctor. Uh, I focused my career on trying to empower people with health information, particularly that they get through the media. You know, I think as we know, Dr. Schaefer, there's um, a tremendous amount of inaccurate information that flows through uh, being online and on television and in magazines. And it's important to help people gather uh, transparent, accurate and valid information and use that to protect their families and themselves. And that's what I've dedicated my career to. Thank you very much. And um, right now, for example, in 2021, we've seen number of things changed. Number one, we have new scan for prostate cancer. Number two, we have new guidelines for screening of colon cancer when we start colonoscopies at age 45 and not 50. 
we have new um, medications in uh, very unique mutations in colon cancer called KRAS. And in the past, it would be like a sci-fi to have something like this, but now we can target. We have new treatment after resection for kidney cancer when we give immunotherapy. We have new, um, the HER2 targeted medication and gastric cancer. And I probably can just go on and on and on, but I would like to hear your perspective from your standpoint, where do you see um, how we can educate community and with all this information to bring it more to basic level where we can all understand? Yeah, you know, you're bringing up such amazing uh, evolutions and in, in the way we treat our treatment modalities, the way we diagnose different cancers, and certainly the field of oncology really is exploding. I think one of the most imperative things coming out of this particular year is the fact that so many people have missed their cancer screenings because of this pandemic. And so as a member of the media, I think it's incredibly important for doctors who have a platform to encourage their patients to go in for their annual screenings and to educate them once they're in the office about what the different treatment modalities may be evolving to. You know, I think when it comes to looking at different types of cancers that have been missed, unfortunately, and I'm sure you see this in the office, a lot of people have skipped their annual screenings or the screenings that are necessary, let alone even understand that the screenings for colonoscopy have indeed changed. One of the other things I find imperative from my standpoint is to educate people about their family history of disease. Um, you know, it's one of the single most factors that can be life-saving for people to recognize what patterns of disease may run in their family, and in fact, when to get screened, right? So we'll see that the average age to start a mammography is still 40, but if you have cancer in your family as a woman, especially breast cancer, the screening modality may change where you need a digital sonography or an earlier mammography. Uh, it's very important to know your individual history and your family history of disease and getting that message out through media platforms, I find is incredibly important. And this is very valid point, but where do we start? So for example, right now as an oncologist, we basically wake up in the morning, we look on our phone device, so what we have and we see what else new um, FDA approved. And uh, for the past year, I think FDA approved close to 16 uh, new medications in oncology. And how, where do we start? Like if the you know, person at home and uh, you know, everybody busy with family and you know, holiday season and life event happen and everyone gets so busy, we just have to get where is the groceries, how to keep up? What is the best way to keep up with all of it? Yeah, you know, the studies show us that women are typically the primary caregivers in the family. So women tend to relegate their own health care to the bottom of the list. They kick themselves to the curb, unfortunately. You know, women control the health care of their, of their partners, of their children, of their aging parents, whether it's in-laws or their own parents, and tend to relegate their own health care to the bottom of that list. And so it's really, really important to make dates on a calendar, if you can, for everybody to go in for their annual doctor's appointments, because the patient has no idea what the new technology is, what the new diagnostics or therapeutics may be if they're not even in the office or they haven't been diagnosed with anything. So in order for the doctor to effectively communicate with the patient, the patient needs to be proactive and make those appointments. I find what's interesting, at least in the United States, is we do have this health calendar, right? So we have February is Heart Awareness Month and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, it's important to make those uh, appointments at least on a yearly basis so that you remember when it is you need to go in for the screening. And that's really the object, I think, is to get people into the doctor's office, to get diagnosed early if there is something to screen if there's not, and then for them to understand what new what new therapies may be available if, if they need it. Um, thank you for that comment. And uh, actually making calendar, it's very, very important. And um, on a good, in, excited and enlightening part, uh, I was just looking at the statistics for uh, American Association Cancer Research and the reports showed that from 1971 to 2019, the number of cancer survivors grown from 3 million to 16 million. So we are making, yes, we are making progress. 
and five-year survival rate for all cancers combined increased for, from 49% in mid-70 to 68% in 2017. Do you have any comments about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would play music in the background and dance if I could. Uh, yeah, you know, this is yeah. wonderful news. I mean, and as you know better than I do, there is so much uh, that has evolved in the last three decades in the field of oncology across the board for every different type of cancer. And as you know, early diagnosis is key for a good prognosis for all of these diseases. Unfortunately, some cancers tend not to show any symptoms and that's why it's incredibly important to get in and be screened for these different types of cancer and to know your history of what you may be more vulnerable to than the average population. But if you look at these numbers, it's definitely something to celebrate. And it's amazing to me to see all of these different therapies, gene therapies, individualized medicine, all of these trends that we're seeing in 2020, 2021 into 2022 that will help increase longevity for people. Cancer used to be a death sentence in many ways three decades ago, and now it's become a chronic disease that if you're treated early, you have the potential to live out your life in fullness, uh, you know, healthy and and with a good sense of wellness. So. It's, it's amazing news and really exciting, and it's important to get the word out there. But again, we need people to come in for their screenings in order to get that diagnosis early to increase their longevity. And uh, I really appreciate how you advocate of women's health. And right now, especially during pandemic, being so busy at home and, uh, you know, for women, uh, not only physicians, but any occupation, it's so difficult to keep up with work and then everything keep at home plus having children so how do you address that message how we can maybe educate community and stand up for ourselves yeah no it's it's such a good point i think you know as i mentioned a lot of the studies show us that women unfortunately are at the bottom of their to-do list and we need to make sure that women understand how imperative it is for them to take care of themselves as well and you see this you know from postpartum all the way into geriatric women it's the same issue where we're you know we're definitely we have a predilection to be the caregiver but we rarely take care of ourselves well and so outreach into all sorts of communities is really really important making a date with yourself to take care of of your health going in for your annual screening whether it's a pap smear or you know a, a pelvic exam whether it's a mammography or a colonoscopy the other thing that i wanted to mention is certain diseases have this uh stigma of being not women diseases so colonoscopy colon cancer is one of those diseases that typically was thought of as being an, a man's disease and it wasn't until katie couric a couple years you know back we're, we're going back probably a decade plus did a colonoscopy on the air, actually, on the Today Show, uh, and shed light upon the numbers of women that are affected by colon cancer. Did women actually recognize that they could suffer from colon cancer very often in the same statistical uh, you know, analysis as men? And so all of these diseases affect men and women. Um, and it's important for women to realize that their breast cancer risk also comes from their paternal side, not just their maternal side. These are things as doctors that we take for granted, but it's not common knowledge, unfortunately. And women need to know what diseases they're at risk for and what screenings they need at certain ages. And I tend to you know, gravitate towards that in my writing, putting out what screens are necessary in each decade, uh, in addition to advocating for busy moms to get in and make their own appointments. Um, I like how you express, especially about being not necessary women's uh, cancer or women's malignancy, because a lot of times we hear in a lot of young population and among even young women always say, it's not me. <laughs> it's not yeah. me. I'm just tired and uh, I just was busy. I didn't sleep. And we always have tendency to look for those excuses and uh, ultimately it, anybody can get cancer so we really advocate if someone has any changes with the body go and screen exactly i think that's such an important point knowing your body looking at your body in the mirror looking for changes you know it's it's interesting i do a lot of advocacy around breast cancer and most women have one breast that's a slightly different size than the other breast um but 
a mass can grow in one breast and make one breast grow differently than the other. And so you need to know your baseline. It's so important to look at yourself, to continue to do self breast exams, to know and look for any changes, as you said, that could bring you in to see a doctor. Sometimes women are afraid to go to the doctor. And I always say it is vital to understand your doctor has seen and heard everything, that the best thing that you can do, the gift you can give yourself is to go address any change that you may see in your body with your doctor because it can be life-saving. And follow up on the point that you mentioned earlier that it can be paternal side or other. It also second and third degree relatives. Sometimes we only think about, you know, mother, father, sister, brother, but it also second and third degree relatives. Very true, yes. And uh, so um, now with uh, so many new changes and uh, for the past year, a lot of new approach coming from uh, vitamins and supplements. And we found out that a lot of times, you know, patients basically hiding. They don't want to tell doctors or healthcare professionals that they are taking alternative medicine, that they are doing something on the side. And uh, this is big gap and miscommunication. And uh, they feel that if they tell something to the doctor, doctor will say no. And, uh, you know, they, it's really important what they take and, and new holistic approach medicine. How do we take approach from your standpoint here? Such a good point. I think, you know, if you, if you look at the things that people do not divulge to their doctor, it's mm -hmm. either on their sexual practices, their diet practices, or, you know, smoking alcohol and drug use. But you can put supplements into that because many doctors are, many people are concerned that their doctor doesn't welcome uh, other than Western philosophy. So I know of many people that will hide any supplements that they take, but it's very, very important that patients feel comfortable to have an honest and open conversation with their doctor, especially because many supplements and herbal remedies may interfere with some of the other medications that doctors need to prescribe. And if they don't have a total body picture of what patients are taking, they can't fully help them. And sometimes they can prescribe something that's harmful. So it's very, very important for patients to have a comfortable relationship enough with their doctor to feel that they can tell them whatever it is they're ingesting or taking in their body, in addition to any of the practices that they may be doing, whether they're smoking, you know, whether they feel that they can't, uh, you know, divulge their sexual practices. I often say, if you feel that you can't have an honest and open relationship with your doctor, it's important to find one that you can because this is a vital relationship for you. Your doctor is there to help you, not to judge you. Um, many supplements that we see, you know, are uh, can be very, very helpful. And it's important for the doctor and the patient to have an open mind, I think. But the other thing I wanted to say was it's really important whether taking vitamins, minerals, or supplements to understand that there are side effects in these medications. And I'm one who personally took too much vitamin C in my life especially when I went to medical school, um, my mom told me to load up on vitamin C and because it's a water soluble vitamin, I always ran slightly dehydrated. I ended up getting a kidney stone of oxalate, which is the breakdown product of vitamin C. I didn't realize that even though something as harmless as vitamin C, it can have, a, mm -hmm. have side effects if you don't, if you're not careful and you don't regulate the amount that you take. Sometimes supplements have 833% the RDA, which is what my supplement had, the recommended daily allowance. This particular supplement had 833% and I would take two pills every day without washing it out with water. And we need to pay very close attention to what we're putting into our body and to follow those labels accordingly because vitamins like a vitamin B, C, A, D, E, and K taken in too high a quantity unfortunately can have side effects. So we need to report those to our doctors and take them judiciously. Yeah, thank you. Especially a lot of times we also see it could be almost like a drug drug interaction. Excellent. And uh, one more question. Um, right now with a new molecular profile and with a new treatment, we have um, car tie, we have CAR-T therapy, we have so many new uh, changes. And the main, main factor, what I see a big barrier is the healthcare disparities. And uh, with um, unidentifiable certain patient population, we just maybe not finding the right treatment uh, because of that, not address healthcare disparities. Can you comment uh, on that? 
Yeah, I mean, this is one of those areas in medicine that there is something that we all need to pay very close attention to. There's gender disparities in medicine, there are racial disparities in medicine. And what we are seeing, I think, as we move into the 2020s, you know, in 2021, is that some treatments really are going to be individually tailored to the patient. Certain medications work differently for different groups, certain diseases affect different groups differently. And it's important for all of us, no matter what our background is, to keep those issues on our radar screen to make sure people have equal access to health care. Certain communities suffer from different types of, you know, complications from diseases because they don't have access. And it's a problem for all of us. All of the health care providers need to be taught this in medical school. I think it starts with education to understand that different diseases, different conditions affect people differently, different medications work differently, and certain groups, unfortunately, for lack of access or socioeconomic concerns may not have uh, you know, access to proper care and um, their diagnoses may come later. And we need to really address that, I think, collectively. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Weider. I feel like I could speak with you for another uh, infinite amount of hours. And um, so how people can follow you or find you or connect with you? Thank you. I'm on at Dr. Weider. It's D-R-W-I-D-E-R -E across social media. And I have a website, drwider.com. Thank you very much. And everyone, connect with Dr. Wider. And uh, this is was Dr. Jennifer Wider, a health expert and women's advocate. Thank you very much, Dr. Wider. Thank you for having me. We received many questions from you, and we will answer them all in the next few episodes. Visit and uh, submit your question at the doctorconnect.org, so then your question will be answered one of the first. And subscribe our YouTube channel. Today, selected question was following. I can't believe I was diagnosed with cancer. I feel like if someone would just explain why it takes so long from the day of the diagnosis to the day to start treatment. First of all, I'm very sorry to hear that. And there are many pressing questions about cancer diagnosis and treatment. It would depend on the type of the cancer, but I will share the process of how it works behind the scenes in a medical setting. Learning to navigate the healthcare system is very stressful and challenging. It is more stressful than ever to see the doctor while wearing masks make it even more difficult to understand your medical plan and even terminology upon a cancer diagnosis. I know firsthand that patients are often overwhelmed with the categories of information needed to make informed decisions for themselves. From the moment you heard you have a cancer, everything seems so slow. Even every five to 10 minutes is so slow. I want to simplify and show you how decisions are made behind the scenes. It all starts with the pathologist identifying the appropriate diagnosis. Once the proper diagnosis is proven, all information is discussed at the multidisciplinary team meeting. It means that the doctors, experts in different fields and other healthcare professionals get together to review diagnosis, review your scans, such as CAT scan, MRI, PET scan, and others, pathology, and then make the best informed decisions. Only after that, plan finalized based on the latest research, guidelines, and evidence-based medicine. We have several types of treatments, such as chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapies, in addition to radiation and surgery, including microinvasive surgery. All tests, procedures, treatment, require prior authorization from insurance companies. We do complex genetic and genomic tests in many advanced cancers to determine personalized treatment. I will give you three strategies to help while you're waiting for your test, your appointment, 
or treatment plan to be started. And hopefully this process will be a little bit less stressful. Number one, write down a list of your new symptoms in advance before you see the doctor. Number two, make a file of all tests you have done and all doctors you have seen in the past, if you can. Number three, write down your questions in advance. For example, ask about clinical trial or standard of care treatment. I hope it helped. When it comes to health, especially bohemas like a cancer, it's very overwhelming. Please submit your questions and comments on the doctorconnect.org and we will answer them in the next episode. If you are looking to success in 2022, stay tuned. I have my new book coming up that help you harness your power and implement realistic success plans to become a better leader, both personally and professionally. Thank you so much for being with us on the Dr. Connect show. Join and subscribe our YouTube channel and comment and visit the doctorconnect.org, ask a question, or you could be featured on our show. We are super excited to have you on this journey with us. Thank you for watching and listening, and we are looking forward to seeing you in the next one. If you put things off and never take action, instead of building more knowledge in the beginning, later it could be more financial, physical, and emotional distress. People reach out to me to put a video so they can learn at their own pace at the comfort of the home. And if you are interested in knowing more information or earlier or other options, then we would love to share with you and show you more steps. We want to help. We want you to feel free, comfortable, decrease anxiety, and add value to understanding. And if this is something you're interested in, then please click the button below, and we would love to speak with you and share more information. I hope this video was valuable, and I hope you can take some nuggets of wisdom and decide what's the best information for you and design your best personal roadmap.